Hello everyone. Today I continue my lecture on China sub Saharan Africa. Uh, in this uh, lecture, I will take a look at the impact of China's growing presence in sub Saharan Africa. Effects of China's increasing role in sub Saharan Africa have been a topic of intense debate. In this lecture, I will discuss the economic impact first, and then I will look at the social, political, and environmental effects. Official Chinese statements consistently refer to the relationship between China and Sub-Saharan Africa as a win-win relationship, emphasizing the mutual benefits for Africa and China. And uh, public opinion polls in a number of uh, sub-Saharan uh, African countries have shown that a majority of those surveyed has a positive view of the economic impact of China, particularly in terms of the infrastructure that has been built and the availability of cheap Chinese products. On the other hand, some Western and African critics see the relationship as a neo-colonial one in which China exploits African resources and dumps its products with no regard for African interests. In place of such broad generalizations, I will take a more nuanced uh, approach as I did when I discussed uh, China's impact on Latin America. I will distinguish between direct impacts involving the bilateral relations between China and Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, indirect ones arising from China's effects on global markets and prices. I will also distinguish between complementary and competitive economic uh, impacts. I allow the possibility that the effects can differ between countries, between sectors and groups within countries and uh, over time. This section focuses uh, on three key issues that are at the center of the debate over China's economic impact on Sub-Saharan Africa. The first is the impact of China on the region's exports and the way in which export expansion has contributed to or impeded the growth. The second concerns the contribution that China is making to reducing Sub-Saharan Africa's massive deficit in terms of transport, power, and communication infrastructure, which is widely regarded as having held back economic growth. Finally, I'm going to look at China's impact on the manufacturing sector. Sub-Saharan Africa's industrial sector is relatively small and uh, underdeveloped, so China's impact on the sector may prove critical. The clearest example of a complementary relationship between China and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is provided by the reasons exports of commodities to China. As I mentioned several times in the past lectures, from the late 1990s, China's extensive or resource-intensive industrialization created an enormous demand for energy and minerals, much of which had to be met by imports. Sub-Saharan Africa is a region with abundant supplies of raw materials that had been relatively underexploited in the past. There was therefore a good match between China's needs 
and uh, what Africa had to offer. In practice, only a handful of sub-Saharan economies have been directly affected uh, by this rush for resources. Although China's imports from sub-Saharan Africa grew rapidly during the first decade of the 21st century, they were concentrated in a few countries with South Africa, Angola, Sudan, and Republic of Congo accounting for around four-fifths of the total. At the peak of the commodity boom in 2011, only eight sub-Saharan African countries sold more than 20% of their total exports to China. These consisted of three oil exporters, that is Sudan, Angola, and Congo, four mineral exporters, Democratic Republic of Congo, Mauritania, Zambia, and South Africa, and one timber exporter, Gambia. The direct effect of China on the exports of the remaining countries in the region was relatively uh, small. And uh, even on those countries that had a large share of exports to China, China's demand may not have had uh, as much impact uh, as uh, it appears. South Africa and Zambia have well-established mining industries, and they would be able to find alternative markets for their minerals even in the absence of exports to China. Nor has China played a major role in expanding supply in the two countries. In South Africa, Chinese foreign direct investment in mining has been limited and mainly involved participation in joint ventures in existing mines. Chinese investors have played a moral role in Zambia, where non-forest company Africa, a subsidiary of China's non-forest metal mining company, acquired the Chambishi copper mine in 1998, when uh, it was privatized by the Zambian government. NFCA invested uh, 150 million US dollars in uh, rehabilitating the mine and uh, bringing back uh, into production. But uh, it remains a relatively small player, uh, producing between five to 10% of the total Zambian copper output. China has played a much more important uh, uh, role in the development of the mining industry in the Democratic Republic of Congo and uh, Mauritania. The early development of mineral exports from Democratic Republic of Congo to China was the result of Chinese uh, traders who entered the country during the late 1990s and early 2000s to buy ores from artisan miners. After 2006, many larger private Chinese companies became involved in the industry and some degree of local processing developed following a ban on exports of raw ore imposed by the local government in 2007. The Sikomin agreement has given a further impetus to the mining industry. Given the conflicts and political instability in the country during the period, which limited Western involvement, China played an important role in the growth of 
Democratic uh, Republic of Congo exports. China also made an important contribution to the growth of exports from Mauritania through the construction of a deep water port at uh, Nouakchott in the 1980s and a further loan for the expansion of its capacity in 2006. More recently, China has also been involved in building a new iron ore terminal at the port of Nuadibu. The most obvious example of a country where China has played a key role in the growth of exports is Sudan, uh, which has been subject to U.S. sanctions since 1997 and uh, came to depend heavily on the Chinese market and investment by Chinese companies. China played a more limited role in the development of the Angolan oil industry and the fact that uh, Angola has been a member of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, since 2007. And because of that, in theory, subject to production quotas uh, may have limited uh, the extent to which its exports to China uh, represent a net increase in the quantity of oil exported. The indirect effects of China on sub-Saharan African exports through its impact on commodity prices are more widespread. But uh, even here, they have uh, only benefited a minority of sub-Saharan African uh, countries. It is true that the terms of trade of the majority of sub-Saharan African countries improved during the commodity boom, but this was not solely due to China. First, uh, there are substantial differences in the impact of uh, Chinese demand on different uh, commodities with the strongest effect on the prices of minerals and metals. Second, in contrast, the surge in energy prices owed much more to supply-side factors than to the growth of demand from China. China had a moderate impact on feedstuffs, particularly soybeans and uh, sawn wood. In the case of um, a few sub-Saharan African countries where manufacturers constituted an important uh, share of total exports, the growth of China uh, has tended to depress the prices of uh, manufactured goods. Uh, this impact was felt particularly strongly uh, in the case of the garment prices after China entered the World Trade Organization and the subsequent ending of the agreement on textiles and clothing. Because uh, Mauritius, Lesotho, and Madagascar specialized in clothing, it is not surprising that uh, they were among those African economies whose terms of trade worsened between 2002 and 2011. In summary, the direct and indirect effects of China on sub-Saharan African exports have brought significant economic benefits to a minority of countries whose economies are complementary to China's because they specialize in commodities that are in high demand in China, minerals, oil, and timber. Despite the general claims made about the impact of China,
the majority of sub-Saharan countries remain relatively little affected by Chinese demand, particularly those that export mainly agricultural commodities. Finally, sub-Saharan African economies that export manufactured goods have been negatively affected. An increase in exports and improvement in the terms of trade uh, can have a positive uh, effect on a country's growth in the short and uh, medium term, but uh, critics question the long-term impacts of specialization in primary products. The so-called resource curse literature points to the poor economic performance of many resource-rich countries. Critics of China's involvement in resource extraction in sub-Saharan Africa have argued that uh, it has given rise to Dutch disease. If it uh, really um, did, the impact uh, may not uh, have been uh, that large. One indicator of the potential existence of Dutch disease is the appreciation of a country's real effective exchange rate. Of the sub-Saharan African countries, uh, which export minerals and metals, only Zambia and South Africa had a significant appreciation of their real effective exchange rate between 2001 and 2011. All of the oil exporters in the region saw their currencies appreciate over the period, but China's contribution to the global oil uh, price rise was less significant than in the case of minerals, as I said. As I said above, China did make a major contribution to the development of the oil industry in Sudan and uh, so could have had uh, a Dutch disease effect there. But elsewhere, the appreciation of the exchange rate was mainly a result of global conditions. The likelihood that trade with China uh, leads to Dutch uh, disease effects is also reduced by the excessive use of resource for infrastructure deals in sub-Saharan Africa. Because increased foreign exchange earnings are used to repay loans made by the Chinese policy banks to finance infrastructure built by Chinese companies, the impact on expenditure within the host country is relatively limited. This is therefore a useful mechanism for avoiding currency appreciation in the short term. Export instability is another disadvantage of specializing in a few primary commodities. Primary commodities tend to be much more vulnerable to price fluctuation than manufactured goods. While countries may benefit from increased export revenues, during a boom period, but uh, they suffer uh, the consequences of the bust, uh, which inevitably uh, follows. Over the entire cycle, economic fluctuations uh, make investment more risky, and this tends to depress economic growth. Indeed, many African economies were negatively affected by the drop in commodity prices and the major exporters to China, including Angola, Sudan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, so the value of exports to China 
whole after 2011 or 2012. As I explained in my previous lectures, Sub-Saharan uh, Africa has experienced a huge infrastructure gap, especially with the Western aid shifting its focus from project financing to program financing since the late 1970s. The infrastructure deficit in Sub-Saharan Africa has led to inadequate supplies of electricity causing power outage, high transportation costs, and logistical and health problems. These in turn tend to reduce productivity and slow economic growth. It has been estimated that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa needs to spend almost $75 billion a year on infrastructure development, including over $40 billion on improving power supplies. And China was willing and able to fill that gap. It had the money and experience. As uh, we have seen, China's uh, filling sub-Saharan African infrastructure gap was made in three forms. Foreign direct investment by companies like uh, Huawei and uh, GTE projects and loans and aid. There are various estimates of the level of China's involvement in the infrastructure in sub-Saharan Africa. The World Bank calculated that uh, its financing commitment to infrastructure projects increased from less than 500 million US dollars in 2001 to 4.5 billion US dollars in 2007. More recently, it has been estimated, based on aid data figures, that between 2007 and 12, the average flow of Chinese infrastructure funding was around 5 billion US dollars a year. The Infrastructure Consortium for Africa gives the much higher figure of 13.4 billion US dollars for both 2012 and 2013. In 2013, China accounted for around a quarter of all external finance for infrastructure projects in Africa, making it by far the most significant source of finance in this region. The sectors within the greatest uh, infrastructure requirements in sub-Saharan Africa are power and uh, transport. Almost half of China's uh, loans to Africa between 2000 and 2014 went to these two sectors. Not surprisingly, Chinese projects also concentrated in these sectors. Between 2005 and 2016, almost half of the value of such contracts was transport related, and a sixth involved hydroelectric projects. However, several concerns have been raised in relation to Chinese infrastructure projects. The first concern is that uh, much of China's um, uh, finance is tied to Chinese firms and products. Uh, this would be a problem if Chinese suppliers tended to be high cost, or if there was a limited uh, competition among them. In fact, Chinese companies tend to be 
highly cost competitive as indicated by their success in international tenders when they face competition from non-Chinese contractors. Uh, there has also been intense competition in the Chinese construction industry, which is, after all, one of the factors that has led firms to expand overseas. A second concern relates to the terms on which China provides finance for infrastructure projects. As uh, I discussed in my previous lectures, many of China's uh, infrastructure loans involve swapping uh, resources for infrastructure. Uh, this makes uh, calculating the financial costs uh, involved uh, very complicated. Interest rates themselves are in line with those in the international capital markets, but we cannot deny that uh, complex and uh, multiple uh, processes leave rarely identifiable rooms for uh, corruption and uh, fraud. Another concern raised in relation to Chinese provided infrastructure relates to quality. Uh, one uh, much published uh, case of uh, poor quality Chinese construction was the Luanda General Hospital. The hospital had to be evacuated in 2010 because of fears that the building would collapse. Despite the reports of um, substandard work in some Chinese projects, there are also examples of Chinese companies achieving high quality work. Problems of poor quality are often attributable to a lack of government oversight and corruption uh, in the host country. In the Angolan case, some critics have suggested that the lack of uh, project durability serves the interests of the local elite by ensuring a stream of new contracts from which they can benefit. Another criticism of Chinese infrastructure projects in sub-Saharan Africa is that they are not focused on meeting the needs of African development, but rather designed to promote China's strategic, political, and economic interests by increasing uh, its soft power and ensuring access to oil and mineral resources. But uh, this criticism appears to be only partially justified. Broadly speaking, China is involved in three different types of uh, infrastructure projects in Sub-Saharan Africa. First, some are intended to fill gaps in terms of power generation or remove transport bottlenecks and can contribute to the overall economic development of the host country. Second type may be specifically tied to the extraction of natural resources, that is building oil pipelines or rail links from a mine to a seaport. And uh, these are primarily intended to support exports to China. Finally, there are prestige projects such as government buildings or sports stadiums, which are undertaken primarily for political reasons and do not contribute to increased productivity 
or improve the economic performance. If Chinese uh, projects uh, fall predominantly in the second and the third categories, a degree of skepticism about their contribution to development would be justified. But there are more evidences vindicating Chinese. As for the criticism that the roads, railroads, and ports built by Chinese in Sub-Saharan Africa are primarily built for the purpose of extracting resources from the continent and replicate the kind of infrastructure that was built during the colonial period. I have to say that uh, it may be hard to distinguish between projects primarily intended to facilitate resource exports to China and those which contribute to economic development uh, more generally. Secondly, in some cases, projects such as port development, which are primarily motivated by resource extraction, can also have a wider development impact. As I discussed, indeed, there are numbers of Chinese prestige construction projects such as the African Union building in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, the foreign ministry building in Mozambique, and the several sports stadiums such as those built for the African Cup of Nations in Angola, Gabon, and Equatorial Guinea. But these do not account for a major share of Chinese loans. One of the most visible signs of China's presence in Sub-Saharan Africa is the ubiquity of Chinese goods in the region's shops and markets. And it is often claimed that the Chinese competition is having a negative impact on local industry. Uh, local manufacturers being displaced by Chinese imports, or has China made it more difficult for African countries to get on the first step of industrialization ladder? In this section, uh, I will discuss the China's impact on civil Saharan African manufacturing. As I discussed in my first lecture on China's presence in Sub-Saharan Africa, imports of Chinese manufacturers have grown rapidly throughout Sub-Saharan Africa since the start of the millennium. Despite the claims that these products are displacing African manufacturers, much of the evidence is uh, anecdotal. Detailed studies of the impact of increased Chinese imports in particular markets are surprisingly few. Part of the problem is the absence of reliable statistics for most of uh, Saharan African countries that would make it possible to estimate the level of Chinese import penetration in the domestic market. Where they do exist, the figures on local production only include the formal sector and therefore underestimate the actual level. At the same time, where Chinese goods enter the country through informal or illegal channels, the level of imports is also underestimated. But there is no doubt that the share of Chinese imports in the apparent consumption of manufactured goods 
As you can see on the right side diagram, one study of five sub-Saharan African countries found that China's share of the domestic market increased significantly from less than 5% to over 10% in Kenya, Senegal, South Africa, and Tanzania, and from less than 10% to over 20% in the case of Ethiopia. But in interpreting this, we should be careful. This does not necessarily mean that the domestic manufacturers have been negatively affected. Imports from China may be replacing imports from other countries. Chinese exports may have grown due in part to transnational corporations relocating their export production from more advanced economies, particularly those in Asia, to China. Because the major share of manufactured products sold in Ethiopia, Kenya, Senegal, and Tanzania are imported, uh, it is likely that uh, the, the increase in China's share of the market is mainly at the expense of that of other exporters. The situation is uh, different in South Africa, which had had a much stronger manufacturing sector before China came along. Uh, the South African case indicates that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has been negatively affected by Chinese uh, competition. And there is another highly probable negative impact. Given the presence of a strong Chinese competition, local manufacturing may have difficulty developing uh, in the future. Chinese competition in the third market can uh, also have a negative impact on sub-Saharan countries' exports, especially manufactured exports. For uh, sub-Saharan African countries, uh, with the exception of uh, South Africa, which had the only uh, recently uh, started to export labor-intensive manufacturers at the time China joined the WTO. Chinese competition is stopping them from getting a foothold on the ladder of industrialization. The impact was particularly severe on the textile and garment industry, which is usually one of the industries associated with the earliest stages of any country's industrialization process. African textile and garment industry was uh, boosted thanks to two international arrangements. Uh, the African Growth Opportunities Act, or AGOA, introduced by the U.S. government in 2000, gave uh, preferential access to U.S. market for exports from most sub-Saharan countries. This led to a boom in garment exports to the United States from some African countries, most notably Kenya, Lesotho, Madagascar, and Swaziland between 2000 and 2004. By 2004, clothing industry employed 54,000 people in Lesotho, 34,000 in Kenya, and 28,000 in Swaziland. The combination of AGOA preferences 
the absence of any rules of origin for least developed African countries and the U.S. quotas on imports from China under the Agreement on Textiles and Clothing, ATC, uh, which replaced the multi-fiber uh, agreement, created an incentive for firms to use these countries as a conduit for the transshipment of Chinese garments to the U.S. market. In many cases, this involved minimal processing in the African countries concerned and was merely a way of avoiding U.S. quota restrictions. The ending of the Agreement on Textile and Clothing, ATC, meant that such quota hopping was no longer necessary or advantageous. In Lesotho, in the first half of 2005, eight of the 47 garment exporting factories closed, and employment fell by a quarter, while in Swaziland, employment fell by more than 40 percent. Through a spillover, foreign direct investment contributes to technology transfer. Vertical spillovers from FDI occur mainly through backward linkages to local suppliers, but most studies of Chinese outward foreign direct investment in sub-Saharan Africa have found that uh, these are quite limited. A survey of 1,000 Chinese firms in sub-Saharan Africa found that on average they sourced less than half of their supply from local firms. Chinese manufacturers in Nigeria create few backward linkages, preferring to import their imports from China. In Ghana, apart from the plastic recycling firms and steel mills, which use local waste as a raw material, Chinese firms import almost all their imports from China. Several factors contribute to the limited development of linkages by Chinese firms. First, where activities are supported by the Chinese Exim Bank, the tying of loans to the purchases of Chinese goods discourages the development of local linkages. Second, Chinese manufacturers in Sub-Saharan Africa are usually market-seeking, preferring to source their parts and components from their established suppliers in China and tending not to be well embedded in the local context. Third, the lack of local linkages also reflects the absence of local networks of suppliers able to provide the products that are competitive in terms of price and quality. Exports to China also create a few forward linkages through downstream processing of raw materials. Although resource-based manufacturers account for a higher share of sub-Saharan exports to China, then uh, to develop the country markets, the bulk of commodity exports to China are exported in unprocessed form. Another potential spillover from FDI occurs through training of locals employed by foreign companies. The evidence suggests that this channel of technology transfer is also relatively limited, despite uh, some examples which have been widely publicized, such as uh, Huawei's training uh, initiatives.
Generally, since local workers are mainly employed in unskilled jobs, uh, they receive uh, little training, and uh, what they do receive is at the low skilled operational level. Technology transfer to local firms is also limited, except uh, instances where Chinese firms are involved in joint ventures with the local firms. But uh, joint ventures are relatively rare in Sub-Saharan Africa. The bulk of investment is in 100% Chinese-owned projects. In summary, considering all these, it is perhaps not surprising at all that the host governments in Sub-Saharan Africa have a negative view of the impact of Chinese FDI in terms of technology transfer. Given uh, these negative views, Chinese recently began a discourse offensive. A leading Chinese development economist and former World Bank chief economist Justin Lin argues that uh, China is on the verge of graduating from low-skilled manufacturing to become a leading dragon. This will release nearly 100 million manufacturing jobs, opening up a great opportunity for industrialization in Sub-Saharan Africa and other low-income countries. He draws an analogy with the flying geese pattern which has been used to explain the spread of industrialization in East Asia from Japan first to four tigers of South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore, then to Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Thailand, and ultimately to China itself and Vietnam. Lin and his colleagues claim, quote, the leading dragon phenomenon alone can create a sufficient labor intensive manufacturing jobs for developing sub Saharan African countries to bring them to par with the most industrial countries. The number could almost double employment in manufacturing in African countries in a few years, jump-starting its process of industrialization. But I think uh, that uh, it is a remote possibility after all. First, wages in the manufacturing sector in Sub-Saharan Africa are not necessarily low. Wages in South Africa, which has the region's strongest manufacturing base, are considerably higher than in China, as are those in Mauritius, one of the region's most successful exporters of manufacturers. Zambian wages are also on a par with Chinese wages in light manufacturing. Within Sub-Saharan Africa, only a few countries, most notably Ethiopia and Tanzania, have wages well below those of China. Second, average manufacturing productivity levels tend to be considerably lower in most of Saharan countries than in China. As a result, only countries with significantly lower wages than China, such as Ethiopia and Tanzania, are able to compete with China in terms of unit labor cost. Third, other costs are higher in Sub-Saharan Africa than in China, most notably the cost of inputs and logistics. These wipe out any advantage of low wages 
in most light manufacturing sectors. Four, even if wages continue to rise in China, there is no guarantee that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa will become a preferred location for production by Chinese or other firms. Manufacturers are already relocating within China, away from the coastal areas to the inland regions and in other Asian countries where wages are considerably lower. If they do relocate outside China, other Asian countries have wage levels comparable to those in Sub-Saharan Africa and similar or higher levels of productivity. Other Asian countries also have lower input and logistics costs than Sub-Saharan Africa. So in all likelihood, even if Chinese firms decide to relocate, the probable destination would not be Sub-Saharan Africa, but other parts of Asia. So far, I have discussed the economic impacts of China on Sub-Saharan Africa, but uh, implications of China's economic growth go well beyond the economic area. Indeed, some of the most vocal criticisms of China's involvement in the region concern the social, political, and environmental impacts. Not only China's growing presence in Africa is often seen as a threat to Western hegemony in the region, but also its behavior is contrasted with a very benign picture of the West's involvement, which emphasizes poverty reduction, good governance, and environmental responsibility. One of the most controversial aspects of China's impact in Sub-Saharan Africa is the claim that Chinese firms do not employ Africans preferring to rely largely on Chinese workers, particularly in major construction projects. Given the lack of employment opportunities in most of Sub-Saharan African countries, this is a particularly sensitive issue. It is true that uh, there are a large army of Chinese workers in Africa. According to official Chinese figures, there are over 130,000 Chinese workers employed on economic cooperation contracts in Sub-Saharan Africa at the end of 2015. These figures underestimate the total number of Chinese working in the region. Nevertheless, the perception of that Chinese companies do not offer jobs to Africans is not entirely true. A survey of 1,000 Chinese firms in eight sub-Saharan countries in 2016-2017 found that the locals made up 89% of employees. Even in construction projects where reports of extensive use of Chinese workers are most common, 85% of the labor force was local. In manufacturing, 95% of those employed in Chinese companies are local. There is also evidence that over time, Chinese firms have increasingly localized their workforces. Rising wages in China have increased the cost of expatriate workers, making it more attractive to use local workers.
However, the African workforce is mainly employed at the lower levels, and uh, it remains the case that uh, managerial and technical posts are often largely filled by Chinese employees. In the manufacturing sector, the employment issue is not so much one of Chinese firms employing Chinese workers as the impact of Chinese competition on local production and jobs. Competition from imports from China had a significant impact on the manufacturing sector in South Africa and uh, this led to a substantial reduction in employment. Elsewhere in the region, although imports of manufacturers from China have grown and there have been complaints about local job losses, the limited size of the manufacturing sector in the first place has meant that these negative impacts have been relatively small in terms of the employment situation overall. While foreign firms usually pay higher wages than locally owned companies in developing countries, it is often claimed that Chinese owned companies tend to pay lower wages to local employees than other foreign companies operating in the same sector. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, FESA, a Chinese mining company, paid lower wages than Western companies such as TFM operating in the same area. In Zambia, NFC Africa mining is reported to pay the lowest wages in the copper mining industry. A United Nations Industrial Development Corporation, UNIDO, survey of foreign investment in sub-Saharan Africa carried out in 2004 five found that the average wage paid by Chinese firms was only just over half of Indian firms and less than a fifth of that paid by northern firms. A 2010 UNIDO survey again confirmed this, showing that the Chinese investors paid significantly lower wages than either northern or Indian firms. Other common complaints are that workers are often required to work long hours and that overtime is not paid at the higher rate despite the local legislation requiring this. In some cases, uh, it has uh, even been noted that workers uh, are unaware that uh, they are entitled to overtime pay. Construction workers in Chinese companies in Ghana, Namibia, Zimbabwe, and Angola were reported to be working long hours without overtime rates. Serious concerns have also been raised regarding working conditions and labor uh, rights in Chinese-owned firms in Sub-Saharan Africa. Four out of uh, five Sub-Saharan governments responding to the World Bank survey on Chinese investment cited poor labor standards as a concern. Critics uh, accuse Chinese companies of uh, transferring their repressive labor practices from China to host countries. Issues of concern include poor health and safety standards, excessive use of casual labor, hostility 
toward the trade union and uh, the employment of child labor. Two of the sectors in which Chinese companies have been particularly active, mining and construction, are industries which raise concerns over health and safety. There are also numerous reports of health and safety standards being disregarded uh, in Chinese companies in Sub-Saharan Africa. Health and uh, safety standards are also often very low in Chinese manufacturing companies. Uh, there are also complaints about uh, verbal and even physical abuse and the sexual harassment in some Chinese companies in Namibia, Malawi, and Kenya. In 2006, two Chinese companies in Mozambique, uh, Monte de Uro and Irmongis Comercio Kodak, were closed down uh, for physical and psychological abuse of uh, Mozambican workers. Another criticism is that uh, workers are often employed on uh, casual contracts with no job security or benefits. In Zambia in 2007, for example, only 56 of over 2,000 employees at uh, NFC Africa were on permanent contracts, with the remainder either casuals or on fixed terms contracts. But uh, to do justice to Chinese, I have to point out that uh, irrespective of their ownership or country of uh, origin, mining companies often make extensive use of uh, subcontracting to reduce uh, cost. Other foreign-owned mines in Zambia employed only half of their workforce as permanent employees and the rest through contractors. What makes Chinese firms conspicuous is the extreme level of casualization. In the case of NFC Africa, less than 3% were regulars. Casualization is not confined to the extractive uh, industries. In Tanzania, the workforce was substantially reduced and permanent uh, employees replaced by casual workers at uh, Tanzania China Friendship Mill in Dar es Salaam between 2003 and 2006. A similar process of casualization took place in the Mulungushi textile factory in Kabe, Zambia, after it was taken over by the Qingdao Textile Corporation in 1997. Workers were employed on casual terms for as long as uh, 10 years, even though legally they should have been made permanent after six months. Wages for casual workers were about a third of what was received by permanent employees. Casualization in Chinese companies often associated with the absence of employment contracts and the arbitrary determination of wages and benefits by management. In Malawi, 89% of the workers at Chinese companies surveyed did not have a formal contract. Workers, and particularly casual workers, do not receive benefits or at best receive only those that are legally required. Forced overtime is common and workers have to work long hours or face dismissal. Chinese companies are seen as hostile to independent trade unions 
and reluctant to engage in collective bargaining. A study of Chinese foreign direct investment in 10 African countries, which focused particularly on labor issues, uh, concludes that, quote, Chinese business tends to see trade unions as troublemakers, unquote. In Ghana, Namibia, Malawi, South Africa, Nigeria, Angola, and Kenya, most of the Chinese companies studied did not have trade unions and in many cases actively discouraged workers from joining a trade union so that the workers feared they would lose their jobs if they did. Another claim is that Chinese companies exploit child labor. This issue has received a great deal of attention in the mining sector in Katanga, Democratic Republic of Congo, where there is a considerable Chinese investment. Although Chinese firms do not employ children directly, large numbers of children work in artisan mining in the region which forms a part of the supply chain for Chinese investors. There have been reports of child labor being employed by CCCM uh, in Zambia, a company with a particularly bad reputation that has been closed down on several occasions. In general, however, Chinese firms have not been found to directly employ underage workers in sub-Saharan Africa. Some of the critical claims concerning the social impacts of China's presence in sub-Saharan Africa are uh, exaggerated, I think. But there is an element of truth to a number of them. The current state of knowledge concerning many of uh, these aspects has not reached to the level where claims and counterclaims cannot be uh, verified. Uh, oftentimes, uh, claims and counterclaims are uh, often uh, based on anecdotal evidence and individual case studies. So uh, there is a, uh, a need for much more systematic uh, research with a more competitive analysis of uh, Chinese firms compared to other foreign investors in sub-Saharan uh, Africa. In addition to that, we have to keep in mind that Chinese behavior is changing over time. A more uh, balanced approach is uh, also necessary to reveal some of the positive social impacts of Chinese activities. Uh, in this particular regard, I have to point out that uh, Chinese investment created uh, many jobs, despite the criticism directed at Chinese firms for using imported labor, even in countries such as Angola, where a relatively high proportion of Chinese workers are employed, it is still the case that the majority of labor force is African. Because the Chinese firms are heavily involved in labor intensive activities, such as construction, clothing and footwear, they do create a substantial number of jobs for locals. The political implication of China's growing economic relations with uh, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, have created even more controversy than uh, the social impacts. Back in 2008, the economists made a very dismal uh, prediction. 
court. Diplomats and pundits, for their part, fear that the West is losing Africa and other resource-rich regions. China will befriend ostracized regimes and encourage them to defy international norms, corruption, economic mismanagement, repression, and instability will proliferate." Uh, this view has set the stage for much of the academic debate on the political implications of China's growing involvement in Sub-Saharan Africa. On the one hand, there are those who emphasize the negative effects, claiming that uh, China's presence threatens progress toward democracy, the rule of law, and political stability in the region. Other uh, pro-Japanese authors have sought to counter these claims, arguing that uh, there is little, if any, evidence uh, to support these criticisms. Uh, this section focuses first on the three negative claims regarding the political impact of China on Sub-Saharan Africa. First, it looks at the relations between China's economic involvement and the existence of uh, authoritarian regimes in the region. Second, it considers whether China's actions have encouraged corruption. Third, it examines the links between China's presence and the conflict and political instability in Sub-Saharan Africa. A common complaint voiced in the West is that um, China tends to support authoritarian rulers in Africa, undermining the West's agenda of promoting democracy. Frequently cited examples include the regimes of Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe and Omar al-Bashir in Sudan. In contrast, the Chinese government claims that it respects national sovereignty and does not interfere in the internal affairs of other countries, and it is ready to do business with different types of political regimes. Supporters of this view point to the fact that China's most significant economic partner in the region is democratic South Africa. While uh, there are individual examples of uh, both authoritarian and democratic uh, regimes with which China has long economic relations, is there a systematic tendency for China to favor countries that are less democratic, as the critics argue. As I mentioned in my previous lectures, China tends to have particularly strong economic links with the oil and the mineral exporting economies. And as the literature on the so-called political resource curse argues, such economies tend to have less democratic politics. However, beyond this selective affinity between oil and resource-rich countries and authoritarian regimes, does China favor relations with the authoritarian regimes? To give you the conclusion first, the evidences offered by the researches so far are inconclusive, either for or against. It has also been claimed that Chinese actors usually prefer corrupt regimes 
because it is easier for them to achieve their objective by doing business with the corrupt elites. It has also been argued that the Chinese business practices are highly corrupt and that this gives Chinese firms a competitive edge in countries where control of corruption is weak. One commentator put uh, like this, quote, this Chinese way of business effectively matches with some traditional social norms in many African countries and greatly oils the wheels of bureaucracies in host countries to facilitate deals, unquote. By nature, corruption is secretive and uh, it is rarely revealed to the public. So it tends to be difficult to prove with hard evidences. However, all the circumstantial evidences indicate that the Western criticism is more true than false. First, while Western firms are subject to pressure from civil society and legal constraints, such as the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act of 1977 and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, Anti-Bribery Convention signed in 1997, to avoid the situations in which they are likely to be required to pay bribes and engage in other corrupt practices, Chinese firms face fewer pressures. Second, the latest uh, Bribe Payers Index from Transparency International, which ranks major countries according to perceptions of the likelihood that the firms pay bribes abroad, lists China as the 27th out of 28 countries ahead of only Russia. To me, it appears that at least the lack of transparency in many Chinese engagement in Sub-Saharan Africa tend to create scope for corruption. Relations between uh, Angola and China illustrate the link between uh, lack of transparency and corruption. The operations of Angola's National Reconstruction Office, which handled large-scale projects funded by Japanese loans were docked by accusations of corruption before it was finally dismantled in 2010. As uh, exemplified uh, by the recent scandal uh, regarding Isabel Dos Santos, the daughter of the former Angolan President Jose Eduardo dos Santos. The level of corruption in Angola was at an alarming uh, level. The scandal broke out as the result of a Portuguese hacker released um, secret uh, documents revealing uh, the size of uh, assets uh, held by Isabel uh, Dos Santos. And uh, according uh, to the revelation, she is definitely the richest woman uh, in Africa, holding $2.2 billion worth of assets. If you want to know more about the scandal, just Google up, type in uh, Isabel Dos Santos, and uh, you will see um, hundreds uh, of uh, news reports and uh, analyses.
a third set of issues concerning China's involvement in sub-Saharan Africa uh, relates to conflict and political stability. China's uh, extensive presence in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Sudan are examples of its involvement in such situations. Uh, various arguments, including the view that uh, Chinese companies are less risk averse than firms from other countries uh, to claims that uh, China actively seeks to take advantage of conflict and political uh, instability to promote its own interests have been uh, put forward to suggest that uh, China has a greater presence in such countries. It has also been suggested that uh, China's presence may actually be a destabilizing factor and contributes to conflicts in host countries. Past research has found a clear association between dependence on resources and the risk of conflict in sub-Saharan Africa. Conflict is particularly prevalent in countries which specialize in oil or minerals compared to land abundant countries which depend on agricultural exports. Resource rich countries tend to be more prone to conflict than countries with limited resources. Chinese involvement in conflict situations such as Sudan and uh, DRC appears to be merely a result of its uh, quest for uh, resources. There is a weak evidence that China tends to import more from politically unstable countries. On the other hand, there is a stronger evidence that Chinese exports and infrastructure projects go to countries that are more stable. The overall level of bilateral trade, FDI and loans are not affected by political instability. Many of the claims regarding the negative political impact of China in sub-Saharan Africa have been greatly exaggerated. There is no evidence to support the strongest claim that China is exporting its own authoritarian model to Africa or introducing its own corrupt business practices and destabilizing African countries. In all of these cases, internal conditions rather than outside influences, whether from China or the West, are the determining factors affecting political outcomes. There is also very little evidence to support the view that China has prioritized the development of economic relations with countries that have governments that are less democratic or where the level of corruption or political instability is higher. The main drivers of Chinese involvement in Sub-Saharan Africa are commercial and strategic economic considerations and uh, with the um, exception of diplomatic relations with Taiwan, political factors are not significant. The evidence uh, is consistent with uh, Chinese claims that it respects the sovereignty of sub-Saharan countries and is prepared to develop relations with uh, different types of regimes. Chinese simply do not care uh, what type 
of uh, regimes or what kind of a political elites they are dealing with. So my conclusion is this. I tend to think that uh, China has not done what it could have done by treating authoritarian or corrupt regimes on a par with democratic or clean regimes in the pretense of non-interference in internal politics, it virtually helped the authoritarian regimes or corrupt leaders, even if it had not been its express goal. So I think China's fault, if any, is uh, sins of omission, not the sins of uh, commission. Uh, a number of concerns have also been raised over the environmental impacts of China on uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, as we shall see in the next part of the course, China's own uh, development over the past four decades has been accompanied by substantial environmental degradation. This fact fuels a suspicion that uh, China's activities abroad also generate more environmental costs. This is all the more likely in Sub-Saharan Africa, where China's engagement has been particularly concentrated in environmentally sensitive sectors, such as oil and gas, mining, forestry, and infrastructure. The risks are further intensified by the fact that as a later comer in the race for resources in Sub-Saharan Africa, Chinese investments have often gone to remote and ecologically fragile areas, and in some cases to protected national parks. It is also claimed by critics that uh, environmental guidelines and standards applied by Chinese firms and financial institutions are less demanding than those of their Western counterparts, giving them a competitive advantage. It has even claimed that the recent application of more stringent environmental policies in China may encourage China's worst polluters to relocate to Africa. This section considers first whether trade with China has had negative effects on environment, looking particularly at the characteristics of Chinese demand for African products. It then discusses the activities of Chinese firms involved in investment and in infrastructure projects to analyze the extent to which they take environmental considerations into account in their operations. In the process, it also looks at the role played by Chinese financial uh, institutions in promoting uh, or failing to promote more sustainable production in sub-Saharan Africa through the environmental requirements that are attached to their loans. And um, in the last, uh, one apparently positive aspect of China's presence in the uh, sub-Saharan African uh, environment, which is uh, China's contribution in the um, extension of uh, solar and wind uh, power in sub-Saharan uh, Africa.
As we have seen previously, virtually all of Sub-Saharan Africa's exports to China are primary products and resource-based manufacturers, particularly oil, ores, and metals, which tend to have a substantial environmental impact. The growing Chinese market and increased the prices of many primary commodities has created incentives for increased production of oil, minerals, and timber, which may have damaging environmental impacts. Oil exploration, production, and transport can give rise to major spillages with the devastating environmental effects, as uh, happened in the Niger Delta. Mining can lead to direct uh, environmental destruction through vast open-cast mines, pollution as the result of the toxic chemicals used in ore extraction and the creation of vast quantities of waste. Water supplies may also be affected by mines' demand for water. Logging, much of which is illegal, is often unsustainable and leads to widespread deforestation. In the case of exports to China, there are numerous reports of environmental destruction in sub-Saharan Africa but what evidence is there that exports to China are more environmentally damaging than exports to other markets? You cannot blame China's disregard for environment on poor government regulation of environmentally damaging imports into China. The ability of a government to take actions against the imports of goods produced in an environmentally damaging way is extremely limited by World Trade Organization rules that prevent discrimination on the grounds of how a product has been produced. Governments are therefore only able to restrict imports of environmentally damaging products under certain exceptional circumstances. So import regulations are not likely to lead to a significant difference in the environmental impacts of goods exported to China compared to other uh, markets. Of course, there are numerous examples of Chinese firms causing environmental degradation in sub-Saharan uh, Africa. In Sudan and South Sudan, China National Petroleum Corporation, CMPC, has been responsible for the destruction of farmland, deforestation, and the disruption of water flows. In 2013, the Chadian government suspended CMPC's license for oil exploration after the discovery of oil spills in the company's area of operation. Prospecting for oil by the uh, China Petroleum and Chemical Corporation, Sinopec, in the Luango National Park created an outcry, which led to the government of uh, Gabon temporarily uh, suspending the company's operation. A number of small Chinese mining companies in the Katanka region of the Democratic Republic of Congo have been reported for their poor environmental track record. And in Ghana, 
a number of illegal Chinese and other gold miners were arrested in 2013 and accused of soil and water pollution. Major Chinese dam construction projects such as the Meroi Dam in Sudan and the Bui Dam in Ghana have also had a significant environmental impact. In contrast to the reports in the Western media, Chinese studies tend to highlight uh, some successful cases. The China Road and Bridge Corporation avoided the harm to local wildlife during the construction of the Mombasa Nairobi Railway. China Non Forest Metal Mining Group Corporation, CNMC's activity in Zambia in reducing waste, recycling, and increasing energy efficiency is another example of a Chinese company trying to reduce its environmental impact. But still, overall, there are more cases of environmental degradation than protection or preservation. Why are Chinese companies so poor in terms of uh, environmental protection? There are some possible reasons. First, it is only relatively recently that environmental issues have come to the fore in China itself. Second, during the early years of the Go Global strategy, the Chinese government paid scant attention to the environmental impacts of foreign direct investment. The first comprehensive environmental guidelines for Chinese foreign investors uh, only came out in 2013 when the MOFCOM, Minister of Commerce, and the Ministry of Environmental Protection published their guidelines on environmental protection in overseas investment and cooperation. And uh, indeed, China Council for International Cooperation on Environment and Development, CCICED, uh, admits that uh, Chinese firms are 15 to 20 years behind their Western counterparts in terms of adopting environmental approaches in their foreign investments. Thirdly, it has been claimed that uh, Chinese banks are prepared to fund projects which have been rejected by other lenders on environmental grounds and that uh, Chinese firms have been able to win infrastructure and extractive sector contracts because of lower environmental uh, standards. Although the China Exim Bank has produced guidelines on environmental and social if impact assessment of uh, loan projects, and the uh, China Development Bank has its uh, guidelines on environmental protection uh, project development review covering environmental impact assessment and project reviews of environmental impact and requiring compliance with the local environmental laws and regulations, these tended to be less comprehensive than those of multilateral lenders such as the World Bank or International Finance Corporation and the US Exim Bank. I have no intention of uh, defending the 
environmental track record of uh, Chinese firms in sub-Saharan Africa. But uh, still, we have to exercise uh, some cautions uh, when uh, we deal with the accusations leveled at the Chinese funds. First, critique of uh, the environmental impacts of Chinese firms is often accompanied by an implicit and sometimes explicit assumption that uh, northern companies which are subject to stricter environmental regulation at home and uh, have been pressured by NGOs to adopt uh, environmental codes of conduct abide by significantly higher standards. However, this may be a rather rosy view of the environmental behavior of uh, northern transnationals uh, on the ground in sub-Saharan Africa. Indeed, they may have a better track record, but anyway, it is a matter of verification than assumption. Secondly, these accusations often ignore the diversity of Chinese firms operating in the region, which range from large central uh, state-owned enterprises to private small medium enterprises and individual entrepreneurs. Several studies have shown substantial differences in the environmental performance of Chinese companies in sub-Saharan Africa. A study of seven Chinese hydropower SOEs found that their environmental management ranged from good to poor. And uh, there is uh, also some evidence that large state-owned enterprises tend to perform better environmentally than uh, smaller private companies. A study in Mozambique, Kenya, and Uganda by the International Institute for Environment and Development showed greater awareness of Chinese government guidelines for foreign investors among uh, state-owned enterprises than in private firms. Despite this, the sheer scale of uh, SOE operations is uh, likely to result in uh, greater environmental uh, impact overall uh, in absolute terms. Other uh, factors besides national origin uh, may have also contributed to poor environmental performance by Chinese companies. Chinese extractive firms have been late comers in sub-Saharan Africa. Therefore, when they arrived, U.S. and European firms had already acquired the most uh, easily accessible resources. Therefore, Chinese uh, extractive uh, firms tended to operate in more remote areas, which are often more ecologically sensitive 
and in some cases are located in national parks, such as Sinopec in Gabon and Bui Dam in Ghana. They also lacked experience of operating in Africa. And surely there is evidence that the Chinese companies with a longer history of operating overseas tend to perform better environmentally. Uh, from my uh, next lecture, uh, I'm going to discuss uh, the challenges faced by uh, China, economic, social, and uh, political, to see whether China can keep uh, growing as it has to become a superpower rivaling or even surpassing the United States. Thank you. But before you go, take a look. Okay, these are some terms I used in my lecture. I want you to familiarize yourself with the, these terms. Another thing, there is a Chinese saying, 100 words are not as good as one look. I would say uh, one video may be better than several lectures because the visuals contain more information than uh, audio alone. Uh, lectures in a uh, given time. Therefore, I recommend you to watch these films so that uh, you can better understand China's impact on Africa. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you next time.